When looking at flight radar, there are almost only ATR 600 still flying. Have the other variants gone out of style? This is one of the questions I will answer today. Stay tuned. Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I am an ATR captain and instructor. And this is Q&A number 19. So let's go straight into it. First question. Dear Captain Nordahl, as we know the ATR is capable of performing the pushback without the assistance of ground support vehicle, just by using reverse thrust. How do you perform the pushback safely? How do you know when you need to turn since you don't have any rear view mirrors or cameras? Well, we use marshallers. So there are people ahead of us in sight who will uh, direct us and tell us when to turn and when to stop. Uh, there might also be a possibility that you have uh, the tower giving you instructions and information ab about what's behind you, but a uh, marshaller is better. And we don't use this very much because if you're parked in front of a terminal building, there will be people, etc. in front of the aircraft and uh, the blast from the propellers will uh, blow up a lot of dust. So. In, at most airports, you are not allowed to use reverse. Next, why is there a time limit during RTO, research takeoff power, takeoff? At MCT, the torque is 100% and NP 100%, which is the same as research takeoff power with power management at takeoff during takeoff. How come MCT has no time limit compared to RTO takeoff when engine power output is the same? The numbers you are referring to here are for the ATR 42, 500 and 600. Those aircraft are equipped with the Pratt Mitney 127 engine. The same engine they use in the ATR 72. In the ATR 72 the engine has a maximum output of 2750 horsepower. While on the ATR 42 the power is restricted to 2400 horsepower. So there is a lot of additional power available, but uh, because the ATR-42 is shorter, they have to reduce the power, otherwise the rudder will not have enough authority to compensate for an engine failure. So when you look at the numbers, uh, on the ATR-72, reserve takeoff power is 2750 horsepower, that is 100%. MCT is 2500 horsepower, that's 90.9%. And takeoff power is, uh, that's what we use on uh, every takeoff, is 2475 horsepower or 90%. For the 42, it's a little different. The reserve takeoff power is 2400 horsepower and MCT is the same. And you will notice MCT on the 42 is 2400 horsepower compared to 2,500 on the ATR-72, so you are below that limit. And takeoff power is 90% or 2,160 horsepower. Okay, um, time limits are set for uh, takeoff, normal takeoff and reserve takeoff power. So for normal takeoff power it's a 5 minute limit and for reserve takeoff power it's 10 minutes limit. And that's by regulation and uh, to preserve the engine. But MCT can be used when you're flying single engine. And there cannot be any time limit for that, right? Because maybe you're 30 minutes away from an airport, you can land that. So therefore, no limit for MCT. But don't use MCT as a normal procedure. Because if you routinely use MCT, for example, during climb to get faster up, you wear out the engine faster, and that costs a lot of money. Okay. Is it possible to be comfortable on the ATR's jump seat? No. Next. Hello, Magnai. I just have a query regarding the use of beta range in the Pratt Mitney 127 in the ATR for deceleration during taxiing. How often is it used, if ever? I am aware that many turboprops use the beta range as an alternate or supplement to brakes, but it remains unclear to me on the ATAR series aircraft. Cheers. 
But the range is uh, called low pitch in the ATR. On the dash 8, it's called uh, disc. And that allows you to control the propeller pitch directly with the power levers. And that happens when the power levers are below behind flight idle. And unless you have uh, loose objects on the ground like gravel, sand, etc., you can use the slight movement towards behind ground idle, just towards the reverse, and a full control of the tax taxi speed without touching the brakes. I prefer to use this method because I operate on a hard surface with uh, no gravel at all and uh, it saves the brakes because brakes are very expensive and using the pitch is free. Okay. Hello Captain, thank you for your videos. They helped me immensely with my typewriting on the ATR 72600. Apart from my being a first officer on the ATR, I'm also a Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 user and I fly the ATR there also. I have a question for you. Can you recommend any flight simulator hardware manufacturers that produce the FGCP, that's the Flight Guidance Control Panel, where you control the autopilot, for the ATR? I have looked almost everywhere and I can't seem to find anything. Maybe if there is none in existence, you can perhaps create hardware in conjunction with a manufacturer as there is virtually nothing out there specific to ATR. That could be a new gig for you as well in your post-retirement life. Thank you in advance for your suggestions. I don't know about anybody making uh, hardware for uh, Flight Simulator and ATR. Um, Honeycomb Bravo has uh, some kind of autopilot control panel and there are also buttons below that can be programmed. Whether they can be used on the uh, ATR model in a flight simulator, I cannot answer. So maybe some of you out there can uh, help us out if we can use the autopilot pilot on that uh, control. And finally, when looking at flight radar, there are almost only ATR 600 still flying. Have the other variants gone out of style? Or are the economics or are the economics of the 600 just better? Are the special cases to rather have a smaller variant? Cheers. If your business model is to keep the aircraft flying as much as possible, you buy new aircraft, just look at the big uh, low-cost carriers. They do just that. Because the older aircraft, the more maintenance, the more time in hangar you may uh, expect. But if you fly irregularly, maybe just a few sectors a day, you will consider buying all the aircraft because they don't cost much. And the cost of buying old aircraft is pretty low compared to new aircraft. So you may even have uh, enough money to buy a spare aircraft where you can take spare parts while you're waiting for uh, supply of new parts. So it's all about the operation. And should you fly a large or small ATR? That depends on the number of passengers you're planning to carry. If you expect uh, full loads, you buy a 72, but on the more sparse routes, you can use the 42. And back to the main questions, are there only 600 flying around? This is the ATR fleet status as of June 2024. A total of 1,244 ATRs have operational status. 685 of them are ATR 42 and 72 600. That is 55% of the fleet. 370 of the ATRs are 42 and 72 500. And that is 30%. The remaining 15% are all the legacy variants. That means ATR 42 300, 320 and ATR-72-200 and 210. The oldest ATR flying today is uh, serial number 11. It is operated by Policia Nacional de Colombia. Looking at the geographical distribution, we see a majority of 72600 followed by 72500 in Europe. We see the same trend in Asia, and Latin America and Caribbean has a majority of 72600 as well. When we 
we see the same in Oceania. In Africa, we have a majority of 72,500, closely followed by 72,600. And finally, we have Northern America, where we see the majority of legacy models. Many of those aircraft operate in very harsh conditions. And it will be great to hear from you flying in uh, Canada, especially. How does this old ATRs compare with the uh, older Dash 8s, also flying in the same area? What are your experiences? I am very curious to learn about it. And that is all for this time. If you have more questions about ATRs, aviation in general, history, aerodynamics, whatever, please write them down here. I will answer them. Until then, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.